I want to pick up where I left off in the morning, because uh, that's the power. That's the PowerPoint I have. But it's but it's but it's related to to authorized crime, and um, by way of introduction, it's uh, of course it's been it's been a pleasure to be here because of what he's he could be talking about Mexico. He could be talking about Mexico in terms of the relationship between the. And that was the one question I had for him in terms of the role of, of, of organized crime. And in terms of employing this theory of authorized crime, what we see in Mexico is that the president recognizes the existence of authorized crime. And the first thing he did is go after the corruption in the oil fields. It was the very first thing he did. Now, resolving that probably won't, it won't resolve all the other structural problems throughout the country. But I think it's, a, it's an important symbolic and revenue generating measure that he can take to resolve that and try to restore some, some sense of, of justice in Mexico that has suffered authorized crime since uh, the arrival, well, uh, since, since the founding of the country, and especially with colonial rule and the implementation of a legal system that created the structures that they're living under now. But, and then just responding a little to, to the question of, uh, of, of memory, the, one, of the, one of the lemas or sayings of Mexicans in exile is exiliados, pero no olvidados. Because part of it was to create an organization that would continue protesting the wrongs that made them flee the country, and two, to seek asylum here, and you could do, they're not mutually exclusive. And part of that was to create memory uh, of their loved ones by continuing to search for them. Because in the absence, being undocumented, in the absence of mental health providers, the only mental health activity they could do collectively would be to denounce, to do something about it, not to lose their sense, not to become impotent. And so that's, so that's very important. Now. <clears throat> In terms of uh, authorized crime, I think one of the latest cases I won and one of the most emblematic cases of that is Mariana Ibarra Moran, which as a result of being here, I found out it was a kidnapping, a bride kidnapping, not just domestic violence. And I think that an error that I've been committing is viewing all of these crimes as simple domestic violence as a catch-all. But kidnapping is a basis, obviously, uh, for, for possible asylum, especially when it's the way that the doctor presented it, where kidnapping as a political act, and that's subject to, to a debate in the courts whether it constitutes persecution or prosecution. Did the state go after him to persecute or to prosecute? But when it's a political act, then, then there's plenty of, of, of to go on in terms of, of, of presenting as an asylum case. Now, <clears throat> this happened at El Cerezo, the state prison here, when the Pope was here. And when the Cerezo was determined to be the safest prison in the entire, entire North American and Latin American uh, continent, this incident happened. And uh, this 21-year-old uh, young lady, Mariana Ibarra, f fell in love when she was a kid with Lalo. And Lalo was a criminal who fled Tijuana when he, when he was 14 or 15. He was 17 or 18. She was 14. They started seeing each other. He joins a criminal kidnapping group in Juarez and they made a mistake of kidnapping a judge. So he ends up in jail. And he ends up in federal prison. He gets sent to Cerezo. He calls her and says, no seas malita, come visit me, I don't have anybody. He was an orphan. And while he was in prison, he became a member of the Sinaloa cartel. And by the time he got to Juarez, he was the head of the cartel in the, in the, in the jail. So she went to see him and as soon as she became uh, uh, old enough to visit him, 
He says, why don't you come in and I'll call you my wife and we can have conjugal visits. So as soon as he comes in, he beats the hell out of her, makes her her woman, and says, now you're not going to work because my boys on the outside are going to, to uh, continue watching you and making sure you're not working and you're not seeing anyone. And as a result of those threats, she continued going. And she wouldn't want to go, and she would hide, and he would find her from within the jail. And the entire time she's in the jail, she sees the money coming in and him giving it to the warden. Uh, and he had a cache of arms in his cell and phones that he would sell, and he would give a cut to the warden. And so one day, she's witnessing all this, and one day, he beats her so savagely, she can't talk. He goes to another cell to conduct some business. She gets a phone and calls the mother. The mother calls journalists. They end up in front of the Cerezo. They denounce it, and they're forced to release her. She comes running across the bridge, and I take the case. She has a four-month-old baby, and she's locked up at the detention, and they take the baby away, and she's there a year. They won't release her. So that becomes part of the process of prolonged detention. Now, the, the point is, is that we won this case on the basis of it, um, no, that, that's another case. But we won this case, and she was grant, granted convention against torture because of authorized crime. This is the first successful case where the judge cites the relationship with the state, and we had to prove that what this guy was doing was authorized by the state. And you can't have a clear example. It's happening in a prison. It's not like it's even happening in a street you have no control over, but it's happening in the prison. And so we use the concept of authorized crime. And they didn't grant asylum that it was persecution on account of being a woman, persecution on account of political opinion, because her and her family denounced. But the judge, rather than granting asylum, granted CAT. Why? Asylum gives you residency permanently. CAT gives you withholding of removal. And you're here, and you're not deported, but you can be sent back at any time. They could reopen the case. So this was a very, very important case for us. She's still here. She's doing fine. But as a result of this, <clears throat> I learned that all of the prisons are run this way. I mean, authorized crime, the prisons, which is designed to punish people who are engaged in criminal conduct, is the institution that reinforces prison. <clears throat> so it's a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy uh, w w within the criminal justice system itself. And so, and so that's just the latest and, and most successful example of that. What, what I wanted to do is, uh, is continue looking, for example, why did that judge make that decision? That was so clear, I think, in asylum. It's the clearest case of asylum I ever had. But it's because of the ideological bent of the judges. <clears throat> for example, these statistics I've got from <clears throat> TRAC, which is from Syracuse University, and it gra it's, it's a great source of of annual statistical analysis of, of criminal justice systems to include immigration judges. But I specifically looked at the uh, judges for tactical reasons. Where do I want to have a hearing? Okay, and we'll get into some of that more specifics of it. But of the 48 judges, and this was as of 2015, 2015, and, and the statistics should be pretty much the same still today, even though they've hired maybe 10 more. Of those who, and these are the cities that, that, that we looked at, of, of the 48 judges, those who have a 90% denial rate, 13 of them are all ex-DHS employees or prosecutors. Uh, uh, 31 of them had uh, DHS experience either as Border Patrol, ICE, uh, judges, or law enforcement experience. Only eight of the 48 judges had no DHS, Department of Justice, military, state, or federal police activity. So, so, the, so, the, so, the, so, so it doesn't look good going to them. 
generally along the border. And, and you can see, and I, and I ended up with this, but you can see again when you're dealing with Mexican asylum statistics, from 2002 to the present, they're still less than 5%. No matter what happens in Mexico, the, the ideal, ideological bent is still to say no to Mexican and Central American asylum seekers. <clears throat> in 2008, when we do a comparative analysis to, to people who are protesting kidnap and extortion, which is most of our cases, you'll see that um, w w what we had back in 2008, and when we compare it to El Salvador and, and, and Guatemala and Honduras, the, the, it's, it's essentially the same, number one in the world uh, of, of asylum seekers has been China. Um, same thing in 2009, Venezuela and Nicaragua. Colombia used to get like 40% up until the, the early 2000s, and, and that changed thereafter, but it was, it was up there for many years as well. 2010, uh, basically, uh, China had such a high rate of, uh, of, of claims because of the religious persecution against Christians, which is favored by, the, by all administrations, not the persecution, but the protection, and the, um, and the uh, fertility, the one-child one policy. And, and we have the same thing happen in 2011, China, Mexico, essentially the same thing in, um, in 2012, 2013. It's pretty much it's pretty much the same countries and it's pretty much the same the same uh, grant rates. 2014, essentially the same. Uh, and, and that's where you see the, the flow of individuals coming and you see the numbers going up in Mexico and El Salvador having more and more asylum claims. In all these cases, and, and now in 2016, it's up to 17,000, Mexico 12,000, and, and this is what we're undergoing right now with the flow of the Salvadorians. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the El Paso courts, uh, <clears throat> Thomas Refke, Steve Ruley, and William Abbott, those are all in the detained docket. Those are all the El Paso processing. Those are the ones that are dealing with locked up individuals. And you can see that they have amongst the highest uh, denial rates, well, they have the highest denial rates in all of the border, 99%, 95%, 92%. And Eloy is also a detention center. And those are also 96, 95, 94. And then uh, Harlingen, Texas, and Houston, Texas are, are, are a little better. Uh, one of the judges who knows about these presentations and statistics has told me, well, it's because we handle Mexican and, and, and Salvadorian cases, and other areas have higher grant rates because of that. But as you'll see uh, in some of the other slides, it really does depend on the individual judge, and, and also, whether you're detained or not. Also in Houston, if you're detained, the, the denial rate is 195, 88. Why? Lack, lack of access to, the, to, the, to, to counsel, as well as the knowledge of the judges that if I deny it, you're gonna appeal me, it's gonna take you a year or two to get a, a decision. And so, um, same thing in Los Fresnos. Uh, you can see the statistics there now. <clears throat> in, in the El Paso, Texas sector, these, what type of cases are they hearing? And <clears throat> you can see that Mexico, and as Fox News calls them, the other Mexican countries, uh, <laughs> El Salvador, <laughs> Guatemala, and Honduras, and they did, and they did. So it's, it's over 50 to 60% in the combined Mexican Federation, and, uh, and, and, and that speaks to, not to, to a tendency to deny them outright, but, but you can see that they're dealing only with some, some Indians and, 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 and Somalis, but uh, other, other than that, the majority are from those, uh, from Central America and Mexico. <clears throat> and so, the, 
the practice of prolonged detention is part of what I was talking about earlier of the evisceration of, uh, of the process. And, and, and if you remember, I began with the historical expansion of asylum law and international law and the gradual degradation of those rights. And that began in 2008 when the Mexicans started flowing in and that led to the incarceration of many individuals and the division of families uh, and the discouragement of asylum seekers. And where we are at today is in the expansion of that policy that went from prolonged detention. Uh, we're going to hold you for a long time. And if you go through it, we're going to deny 99%. And now we're going to expand it. We're not going to let you in. And if we let you in, we let you in piecemeal. And if we let you, and if we don't, and if we do let you in, we'll divide the families. So everything has been done over the years to eviscerate the process. And uh, this is pretty much, now what's interesting is that Ayala and Tovar are also ex-DHS employees, but, and they're, and they're also seeing predominantly uh, Central Americans or the majority and Mexicans, <clears throat> but their approval, and these are, and this is also in detention, but it's an approval rate. So with this clarion call for more judges, basically to deport people, it really has to be uh, countered with a, a more measured, balanced hiring process because these are Mexican Americans and their denial rates are considerably different even though they have the same training. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting to analyze them in that, uh, in that context. And, and, and it's pretty much the same pattern throughout the, um, to, uh, through, throughout the system uh, with a much higher denial rate in, in other parts of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we have the question. Do anyone have a question? We have two questions. So O'Connor and Deborah. Okay. Oh, more people? Yeah. So, uh, lady first. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, very, very fascinating um, presentations. And I think I have um, one comment uh, on the Nigeria oil cases. Um, I mean, I think that your model of research of, of the, phenom of the um, uh, situation is really fascinating and it should be really important and applied to other cases to understand it and talking to the perpetrators. Um, I think, did you, were you able to speak to the victims themselves and to understand what had emerged from, you know, and I, and I understand the issue of the kidnapping being not considered community and not considered so serious, but ultimately you have the victims and they're, you know, where are the voices of the actual victims and their families and what happened to them in addition to the context and the societal. So I would be happy to hear about that. Um, on Colombia, um, it's fascinating, and I actually want to ask you if we can, if you can share the research with us because we're just completing a mapping. Uh, my organization is mentioned in the peace agreement, and we have a Colombia program that has a big component on civil society. So uh, we are completing a, a, a large research that maps the role of civil society in the issue of disappearances in the broad sense, and the issue of the way civil society has been developed on kidnapping is really under research and under documented, and it would be really great. Have I have. You know? <laughs> no, I have a, I have a few comments though, um, th and and maybe some questions because um, there are there is a negative element to civil society involvement in relation to the issue of kidnapping in Colombia, um, and I would love to hear your views on that. So the first one is um, I would not call the, the 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 mass movement a civil society organization because. The nature of civil society is its nonviolent character. So the moment, it's true that they emerge from citizens, but I think that we need to call it non-state non armed actors and not confuse a violent movement with what civil society does. I think it's, it endangers uh, what civil society actually is. Um, so that's like your first instance of what is the first response. It's armed, but it's not civil society, right? It's a population, it are the citizens, but it's not what the concept of civil society is. Um, se second, to complement, um, I think that one other element, just to continue in the chronology that you have made, is that as a result of the País Libre documentation of ki kidnapping cases, um, País Libre, as it was closing its doors, it was uh, distributed to any actor that it could, the list of, uh, that they had compiled a database of those that had been kidnapped. And that transition was actually given now to the HEP, to the Special Criminal Jurisdiction, with a specific case open um, in relation to 
what they are characterizing, the retention of liberty, which is not called kidnapping for a very perverse reason, but is being called differently. And the perverse reason is that the prosecutor wants to retain the jurisdiction to continue persecuting kidnapping. So the HEP persecutes retention of liberty and prosecutor uh, prosecutes kidnapping. But there, are, there is this handling of the report and there is also a prosecutor's report that documents the kidnappings that had taken place. So I think I, don't, I would be very interested to see how you can, your research can actually complement that and the work that the official sources are doing. And what is very interesting in the prosecutor's um, document actually is that uh, and this is very under-documented in the cases of kidnapping, in particular in Colombia, but I think across also Mexico and other countries, as kidnapping is considered a crime against the elite or the higher classes or the wealthy. As you have mentioned, army and security forces, police, poor poor police members were also kidnapped, but also farmers and people that didn't have a lot of money. So that is coming out in the, in the prosecutor's um, document, and it would be very interesting to, to, for academics to research that impact on non-wealthy victims of kidnapping, because only the wealthy ones get the attention, right? Um, now, my, 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 my comment and my main criticism that also is very important to document is that unfortunately the so the, the, the evolution of civil society and kidnapping in Colombia has also led to um, and, and uh, it's interesting because you say how they contribute to transitional justice but actually Fefcol, you no, know, the founder of the Voices of yeah. Victims radio station, has been one of the main promoters against the peace agreement, yeah. against the transitional justice mechanisms, against, you know, criminalizing the FARC, the, 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 what the FARC done is really a, a very key detractor yeah. of, of that transitional justice mechanisms. So while on the other hand, they are trying to access, you no, know, so there is this tension at the moment where victims are saying, do we oppose? this transitional justice mechanism, or do we support it and try to benefit from it? Uh, and, and that is happening, both things are happening at the same time. But the final, like the most biggest concern I have on the role of civil society or of victims themselves, and this happens, we're seeing it in Mexico, but it really happens everywhere. And I will talk a little bit about it in my presentation, is the politicization of the issue and the clear differentiation, like the victims of kidnapping will not speak and will not sit on a table with the victims of the crimes of the state. They consider themselves different, they consider themselves superior, just like the other victims themselves do as well. And in Colombia, it's, it's very profound, that division. Um, and how to break that division, and what are the attempts to break that division, um, it's, it's something that deserves a lot of attention and effort and, and, and research. And, you know, the negative impact of that, of, of that civil society, or that specific, or by look, is this being wanting to look at a phenomenon, but by doing that, um, then not seeing the whole picture and how it's inserted and there are other victims. Thank you for the presentations. Just a question for Camilo. And I think, yeah. Uh, it's about the term, the use of the term resilience. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people use it uh, to talk about, you know, withstanding s shock. That's I think the the definition of resilience. Uh, but I, I would like to to know more, and I, I really don't like it when people refer to civil society as being resilient. Um, but I would like to know your thoughts about resilience and intimacy. Um, in the sense that, for me, these two concepts are sort of, uh, yeah, against each other, so, uh, so to say. But um, but just wanted to know your yeah. your views on this. Thanks. I think the questions might be longer than the, the, pres <laughs> the presentation by the time we get around. Because I have a couple of um, things I'd like to ask. The first is to Temi Tope. Um, reading about kidnapping in different places, a trend that I seem to see is that it starts off with either political kidnappings by the state or kidnappings by militant groups, and then it mutates into criminal kidnappings. But usually when I'm reading some academic article about Mexico or whatever it happens to be, it usually the starting point seems to be, well, a dictatorship did this or a militant group did this. 
So my question is, um, these sort of social justice oriented kidnappings in the Niger Delta, has there been any mutation into uh, criminal kidnappings? And also within Nigeria, what is the wider patterns of kidnappings? Because you had the Chibuk uh, girls who were kidnapped. And um, I've also heard of ritual kidnappings in Nigeria. So I'm just wondering about the wider panorama, because we've talked about the panorama and spectrum of kidnappings in Mexico, but what does it look like in Nigeria? Yeah. Do they use ransoms? Is the is an additional point from from, from David? Um, <laughs> um, a, a, a subsection of my <laughs> and and then and then for for the three panelists, um, magical legalism is a term that's used in transitional justice about passing legislation which doesn't really address the problem. Right? It's a it's a concept that was coined and it's gained purchase. And I'm wondering, in each of the three contexts, is that something that you've been aware of in Mexico and Nigeria and Colombia, that there's always legislation passed, but does it actually make any damn difference, right? And is that, a, is that a trend we can also see as existing in places that have kidnapping problems? A final question for Camilo is just on the, the diaries. Um, I'm guessing it's elite diaries rather than the, the ordinary people, the ordinary citizens that don't have a profile, but just maybe to hear about who is actually making the diaries. Okay. But that's it for me. Go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a comment on one of the questions. <laughs> We're going to get into <laughs> infinite. <laughs> Infinite regression. And it's just really a defense of Camilo's sketch and his inclusion of violent organizations in his interpretation of civil society because I'd say that civil society organizations aren't or shouldn't be, that they sh you know, shouldn't be violent is, is a romanticization of civil society. And I think it's a reproduction of the sort of liberal globalization type theory of civil society that this topic, kidnapping, really profoundly critiques. That's it. Yeah, and I so on that point and another two ones. So, Camilo, they, I don't know if they ever stop being citizens. So there can also be a romantic version of citizenship, and then buying on this idea. So I actually like that you include non-violent uh, civil society groups because counter kidnapping in Mexico, just to be factual, some of the groups, the the indigenous and and farming groups, use violence to address the issue of kidnapping, and those are are counter kidnapping strategies indeed. So I like the fact that, and, and, and let me go back to the theory of the state, right? So there's a, a huge problem here, and this comes from ethnographic experience. When we used to tell the Mexican government about the state, they say, the state is everyone. We are all the state, my friends. So from that moment on, I always use the word government, okay? Because if you go to the classical Hovetian theory, everyone is the state, my friends. So Let's avoid that in terms of being specific because there's always this game in Mexico. So who's the state? Oh, you're also responsible for that. And part of the global ne neoliberal discourse is that we are responsible for not being kidnappable. We should not wear our jewels, yeah. okay? You should take care of what you do, where you travel. Yeah, and... And Camilo, I love, I mean, the paper, I've seen how it's evolved, and I see now a lot more kind of precise points. And, 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 <laughs> and, <laughs> and part of, I was thinking part of the temporality with, which you're bringing here, um, there are a couple of things that if you're thinking about the conflict, then you can also pinpoint, and I can see that in your presentation, the responses and make a link between the type of responses that you have, and then try to make some sort of like claims about the impact, which I think is, is gonna be the murky side of things, and it's gonna model up maybe another claim uh, about citizenship, so you would have to trace different forms of citizenship d regarding uh, strategies, and that can be very tricky. Um, and the last thing for the topic, I, I heard um, once another scholar from Africa that said that people already plan for kidnappings to happen, right? I mean, I know your case is different, and it, this is kind of like getting back to these old workers. Uh, 
but do you think there's there's some of like an ecosystem of kidnapping going on in Africa that people already plan for this type of violence and then they they respond accordingly? Um, so I, I'm just I'm in the kind of the counter kidnapping strategies. I heard a couple of, of presenters. I think a year ago, said that families had the money already because they know what was the, the average ransom. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of like a strategy, like a, um, a hedging strategy, like in finances, right? You know what's going to happen, then you, oh, well, $300 is not so bad. Let's just uh, have that ready. Um, and yeah, that, that was all. Sorry for the long thing. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, Carlos. I would like to understand more on the objecti objective component. Um, it's gray, and, and I would like to know, for example, um, since Obama era, um, some Haitians were deported, and during Trump's administration, the TPS of Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, as well as Haiti, uh, was, um, was closed, was uh, eliminated. So I would like to know how does that a uh, decision, political decision, works out. Of course, it's sover soberania, no? In español se dice. Um, but I would like to know more about that. And also, um, just a couple of weeks ago, we visited uh, David and myself visited uh, a teenager a teenager shelter, and we talked with the with the with the with the kiddos, and they were expected a date to cross the border, and some of them reunite with their families, but some of them they don't have families. So what happens after um, um, the refugees cross the border? Is there proper institutions that, for example, other than providing them a green card, um, for example, provide shelter or, I mean, a proper um, network to stand up with dignity? I have three questions. One for Carlos, and maybe I'm, it's because I'm not familiar with the, 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 the context you are speaking. In the number of applications that are withdrawn, uh, I think there's a big difference between, between the Mexicans and the other countries. Is, is there an explanation of that? Because that, that's something that is not, not clear to me. And then for Temi Tope, two, two questions. Are you, have you been able to assess the degree of, of effectiveness of these kidnapping strategies uh, from the, the side of the, the different actors? And especially, is there what, what was the counter strategy from the oil companies? How did they adapt to that threat? Fun debate. Um, <laughs> I think lynch mobs are civil society too, so who knows. But I'll leave that. I really wanted to uh, some interesting thoughts on Temi Tope and, and Camilo's paper. I'm really interested in the connection between place and kidnapping, right? That I think that there seems to be uh, different rules about people that aren't in the right place. And the idea that either they're oral workers or they're migrants or they're undocumented or they're deportees, and there's that's a different thing than if someone's locally. So maybe, I mean, both of you could play off that a little bit. I, I find that a really fascinating comparison here. And back. All the way around. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, if, if you don't mind. Sure. So, this is the problem where you are in conference with clever people, right? It's, it's, it's horrible, man, because when you're a <laughs> work in progress, you you always have to to think really, really careful what, what, what you're going to say. So I, I'm just trying to address the, the question. So the first thing is, like, when I started doing this project, I found that it's an under-research uh, topic in Colombia. So. I, I couldn't find like a, a lot of literature or people you're reflecting about this. So that's for the second thing, like the creation of categories to understand the problem of kidnapping in Colombia is really tricky. That's the first thing. It's like a, because the creation of categories and how you address the categories to understand kidnapping are not going to be neutral to explain a really politi politicized set uh, phenomenon in Colombia. So that's, that's the reason that, for example, the positive and negative narratives about kidnapping. Like uh, you can, as uh, you say, Ernesto, you can maybe create a narrative of civil society being like a fighters about freedom and how they do a lot of good things. But at the same time, if you talk about how paramilitary groups that I, I, I see like a, is a counter kidnapping strategy. So if you start to understand 
counter kidnapping strategies in other kind of range, you have to say, of course the paramilitaries in Colombia was one of the groups to start to create this stuff. But it's against how you can make a balance between this kind of positive and negative narratives about kidnapping and how you can create perfect categories to address a highly politicized uh, phenomenon in Colombia. And that's the thing with transitional justice, with the use of the word for resilience, for example, Ariel, that you say like, uh, I was thinking maybe could be just actions of resistance, can be some actions of resilience, can be some action of contestancy, but the, the, the problem is like how we're going to try to understand this without playing the game of repeating all this politicized problem. So, so it's, 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 it's the way. So I, 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 ha I need more time to just rethinking and rethinking about what kind of categories. But definitely I don't want to romanticize any kind of narrative about good or bad. And, and definitely create more powerful and more complex narratives about this, 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 this context. Because I know that my, my job at the moment is really descriptive. It's so descriptive. And, I, I'm, and that's, that's the first stage. But the second is like how we're going to try to understand in more complex narratives with more complex categories. And that's, that's the challenge. And thank you so much for all the comments because bring me a lot of ideas. Like for example, Jeremy, all about this thing about the geography of kidnapping in Colombia could be really interesting to address. Because again, another category is about class for me in this kind of about kidnapping that I really want to explore. Because in the diaries, you know, it's like I'm trying to understand that. For example, the diaries, the diaries, all the, the kidnapping diaries is for wealthy people, like Ingrid Betancourt, the politicians, the high class, uh, or more exposed, like uh, police officers. Always, the <laughs> after, I have a joke, but after the release, they have, okay, how are you feeling? Are you okay, right? And this is the, the, the contract for the book. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, and now you can just go to see your, your family. Because if you are a high profile people, well, you have a high profile in Colombia, you can have that. Anyway, it's just like how you can understand class using that, that, that kind of stuff. And how, of course, you ha we need to do a, some kind of deeply research and really important research about how everyday citizens w that were affected by kidnapping deal with all the stuff, and, and not just the, the royalty. But the diarist narratives is, is very interesting. Sorry, Nasu, yeah. That's a good point. I think everything needs to be fun. Yeah. So don't get into that. I think that's a trap of actually not recognizing the, the gradient of politics that goes all the way. So we stop politicizing because they are contentious, and we can, we can spot it as a contentious space. But beware of that. So the politics of kidnapping. Yeah, is the they go all, everything is politicized from the very category of, of, of kidnapping. Yeah. The law. So that could also be an analytical trap. And I think it's a huge one that we tend to reproduce when we talk about contentious encounters. Yeah. Uh, I think that it is right. And you're totally right that everything is politicized and every topic can be politicized. So there is an element um, when you're talking about class and you're talking about. And it's not, it's not But it's the instrumentalization that actually happens. It's a phenomenon where political actors take that, you know, that the work of civil society, take the victim, take, wa take the victim, their pain, which is everything is legitimate, but then it's taken and it's instrumentalized for these political purposes other than the rise up, right? So that's that's what well, I think we all know. Okay, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's just that the, the right in Mexico is politicized to say, well, you know, yeah. these people are asking for benefits. Yeah. It's not about benefits. This about kidnapping and having the yeah. kidnapping units that tend to just deal with the rich people, right? Yeah. So, but I, I understand instrumentalization. I think probably it's a better way in. But yeah. So see you in Brazil, and hopefully I can just give you <laughs> a better <laughs> answer to all the stuff. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, always allow one of your co-panelists to go first, so you can collect your thoughts. So. That's what I just did. <laughs> okay, I'll start in the order in which the questions were posed. Um, so first, uh, victims of, of kidnapping. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, interview any of the victims. Now, keep in mind, these were mostly foreign oil workers, and following the traumatic episodes, they were often flown out of the country. Uh, some of them, as I uh, um, gathered in the region, left the employment of, of those organizations. Uh, and there were also, for the most part, uh, itinerant transnational workers. Uh, and, and so their families were rarely in the region. So I could not find family members that I could interview. I made efforts uh, with the oil corporations to see if they might be willing to speak with me. Um, they refused. Um, 
I think this was from Kuno, and that is the uh, evolution or trajectories um, of, of kidnappings. Uh, I absolutely agree with your point. I think uh, a lot of these kidnappings are from beginning as political acts, and over time, the <coughs> matters decide into other things. And absolutely, yes, um, it, this has become a criminal enterprise, uh, it, it, for the most part. It has mm. become a criminal enterprise. Um, only if a, a very few number of people would today say that um, that, they, that most of these insurgents are still involved in agitations for uh, environmental justice and, 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 and socioeconomic improvements in, in that region. I think the criminals have taken over. And some of the earlier guys who began this whole exercise have come out to say that. that uh, one of them uh, who uh, spoke with me talked about kidnappings of three and four month old babies. That, that's not our struggle. That, that's not what were about and that they left kidnapping because all the groups had come in and, and, and so forth. Um, you mentioned Chibo kidnapping. That's a very fascinating one because I, I do have uh, a book manuscript that is currently on the review uh, on this particular incident. I was embedded with the Bring Back Our Girls movement uh, from 2015 to 2017. So that book is based on my, my being embedded with that uh, organization. Um, and I do hope to submit an abstract for the ISA in Brazil, so I will be talking about that particular uh, kidnapping episode. Um, I was able to interview some of the family members, in fact, of, of those uh, uh, girls who were kidnapped. Um, I, uh, I made the ethical decision not to interview some of the girls themselves, even when I had the opportunity to, because they didn't seem to be in proper shape for that. I didn't think that they were ready for those questions at the time, although I will also add that one of the girls that I had declined to interview, uh, even though she was ready, but I, looking at her, I didn't think it was uh, proper for me to interview her. A few days later, I did see her image uh, on the BBC website. She had granted an interview to a BBC journalist, so. Uh, ritual kidnapping, yes, that's absolutely correct, and uh, ransoms collected, yes. Uh, but there's also, uh, initially at least uh, in the last uh, eight to ten years, it, time was when it was an elite thing. They would target uh, parents or siblings of government ministers and, 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 and actors and, and actresses uh, and so on. Um, and most famously, the uncle of a sitting president was kidnapped a few years back, uh, and of course, ransom was paid and they released him. Uh, although it's believed to be an insider job, um, uh, the parent of uh, 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 the then Minister of Finance was also kidnapped. So, so the, those tended to be what happened initially, but we're moving into a, um, a period in which it's far more diffused than that. It's far more. Uh, declassed, if I may, in, in terms of um, the the, uh, the socioeconomic status of the victims, it, it does seem like we're moving into an era where uh, it, it's 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 far much more common uh, and less discriminatory uh, than it previously was. Um, so the third question is um, planning for kidnapping. Uh, and, and whether or not there's an ecosystem of, of kidnapping, I would say yes to that, um, although the, its contours vary from one region to another. So as I mentioned, the Niger Delta was uh, fundamentally related to oil workers, but increasingly uh, diffused to non-oil workers. Uh, in the Southeast region, you have more of uh, family-related kinds of kidnapping, so business people who are essentially set up by members of their own families. Uh, the Northeast region where Boko Haram has been operating uh, in the last decade or thereabout, it's a different uh, 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 complexion. It's the, the texture of kidnapping in that region is different from um, the other parts of the country. And then when you go to the Northwest, for instance, you also have kidnappings by, by criminal organizations that have uh, uh, grown in the last five years or thereabout. So yes, the, the kidnapping has become rampant, but there are contextual differences depending on what uh, geopolitical zone um, you're looking at. Um, and yes, people are encouraged, as you rightly mentioned, um, to discipline themselves and not be flashy. So people would have cars that they drive in the daytime and cars that they drive at night. So I, I have friends and, and, and folks who, who actually do that as a way of uh, uh, self-discipline to ensure that you reduce your, the, uh, your, your, the probability of your, being, of your being kidnapped and not flaunt your wealth or, or material possessions um, uh, and so on. Where that leaves um, 
the state, I guess, is, is a topic for another day uh, in terms of the responsibility of the state to, to guarantee uh, uh, um, a life or, or, or the safety of lives and, and property. Um, so this, there was a question around assessment of the degree of effectiveness of, of kidnapping strategies and so forth. Um, now, at the height of the insurgency, uh, the, 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 they were fairly effective. Um, and the country was stunned, uh, if my memory serves me well, in 2006, when oil workers were kidnapped offshore. It was the first time that that happened, and the country panicked, because up until that time, most of the kidnappings were land-based. And so with that particular incident, early in 2006, there was a real sense that these guys had become far more sophisticated than was previously thought, and that they um, uh, uh, challenged and often uh, uh, defeated state forces fairly easily, and which was also remarkable uh, when you consider the background of the Nigerian military in relation to uh, uh, peacekeeping missions and, and intervention, military intervention in the West African sub-region in, in particular. Um, and in terms of what oil corporations have been doing, I think, I think this has you know, uh, very obvious policy implications. Um, now, uh, the oil companies, uh, and I obviously didn't go into that in my presentation, oil companies have uh, embarked on fairly elaborate mechanisms for dealing with this incident. So uh, kidnap and ransom insurance being, being one of those. Uh, and so it, oil, um, it, it oil worker is insured against this risk, they are in, encouraged to essentially watch themselves, where they go, when they go, with whom they go. Um, and uh, some of the uh, uh, publicly available documents in relation to that and some of the reports also uh, suggest a very uh, uh, clear and, and, and comprehensive mechanism for protecting these individuals. So, but my analysis on, on that uh, essentially suggests uh, that uh, each oil worker is, is essentially uh, uh, stabilized and uh, totalized and their, their uh, their, uh, their uh, the class background, uh, level of education, income, uh, families, net worth, and all of those things are uh, put together and, and essentially as, as part of a, uh, uh, an exercise in essentially uh, processually inventing them as a risk statistic. And so the risk level uh, varies quite significantly. So an American is exposed to a higher level of risk than an Indonesian working for the same company on the same oil field. So they, they look at some of those variables and make decisions about who should go where, when, and, and how. Um, the question about race and kidnapping, that's, that's a, it's, I, I find that quite fascinating. Um, now, I did touch, about, uh, touch rather on that uh, in, 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 in my, my book. Um, now, I guess the way to start to address that is that so Nigeria does not have the blatant racial issues of Euro-American societies. We just don't. Um, there are ethnic issues, but they are, they are qualitatively different from racial issues. Uh, and, 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 and that, and I think for continental Africans like myself, we find it fascinating when we you know, migrate to this part. Oh, okay, this is interesting. Yeah. Because there wasn't anything like that in, 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 in that uh, uh, part of the world. Now, and that's, that's a bit of a broad generalization. <laughs> okay, I have two minutes in my response, sorry. Um, so in Colombia, we say, you are kicked out in the world. <laughs> okay. So, so, so uh, but, but yes, here we're dealing with residues of colonialism, um, issues relating to matching of race and space, um, the sense that these this individuals are representing an entity that has not been favorable to the region. And so the relationship between the kidnappers and the kidnappees is not personal. They are kidnapped for what uh, they represent rather than who they are. Thank you. <clears throat> Very briefly, on the issue of withdrawal, <clears throat> uh, why are Mexicans this poor? Partially withdrawing two reasons. One, there's a policy of prolonged detention designed to discourage them from leaving the camps by withdrawing. And two, because of the, relate, the proximity of Mexico to the US and the stability of family relations, it gives them alternatives to asylum. To the question of objectivity, under the Trump administration, that which is objective is subjective, period. That's it, it's, it's, it's a political analysis. And, and three, on civil society locally, 
The response of the El Paso community to the, uh, to the arrival of uh, Central Americans and the inability of the government to deal with it has been fantastic to the point that our Congresswoman Verónica Escobar believes that what's happening in El Paso consistently as a model of new law, and repressive law enforcement measures is designed to retaliate to the El Paso response. Every level of government has, 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 has spoken cl clearly that we're one of the safest cities in the country, if not the safest for a city our size, and, and welcomes the immigrant. And so it goes against his narrative, and she believes that many of the policies and actions have been, are not only cruel, but targeted to this community as a result of the civil response. 